All the tiny heads are back. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Okay. Hi everyone! Welcome to this week's Learning in Space. I'm Nicole Gallucci, postdoc with CosmoQuest, and one of your hosts of this uh, weekly look at education and outreach programs all having to do with science. Uh, and my co-host through the wall is Georgia Bracey. Hi everybody! <laughs> yes, you guys learned last week that we actually are in really? adjacent offices. Um, we actually share a wall. It's which, true. It's, yeah. it's true. But this time my computer hasn't tried to explode, so I'm in my own office running things. Mm -hmm. um, we have with us uh, two of the members of Project Mercury, which I unfortunately keep misspelling the acronym. I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> um, but I do it too. Everybody seems to be having no trouble. Uh, Guido, Guido Bibra said he says no trouble finding the website even with the wrong spelling. So you guys definitely have that going for you. Mm. Um, yeah, so we have uh, David Coyle and Jenna Lang. So welcome. Thanks. Hello, thanks. And I think we're just going to dive right into today's topic. Uh, first, a uh, couple comments on how to uh, talk back to us in a good way, not in a, in a mean way, we hope. Uh, you can use the Q&A app um, through YouTube or Google+. That is the best way to get a comment or a question to us. Uh, Nancy Graziano says, happy birthday, Georgia. <laughs> I saw that. Thanks, Nancy. Happy birthday, everybody. Say happy birthday, so Georgia. It's fun to hear from you every week. And, I want to you see know, you and everybody. Cool. It's great. I want to see the comments filled with birthday wishes for Georgia. So <laughs> get to it. <laughs> the birthday cake sort of icon thing going. Yeah. yeah. Some smileys, birthday, birthday smileys. Um, we also have both event pages up on Google+. Plus. Um, I will probably not be checking that as much, um, so stick to the Q&A app. If you want to uh, say something, say hello, ask a question of our, of our fine guests. Um, although I have seen a couple, um, couple comments come in already. Um, yes, because Michael, Michael Jobin left us a nice pun because this is a, a show about microbes and he is, <laughs> I wear a Mike, M-I-K-E dash robe. Uh, we like puns. <laughs> puns are fun. Good one. So, all right, so sticking to the Q&A app for the most part today, um, go ahead and use that to send in your questions. And we are going to dive right into today's topic, which is Project Mercury, which is a really, 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 really cool citizen science project um, that I heard about back a few months ago and finally got to participate in fairly recently. Um, maybe uh, David or, uh, and or Jenna can give us a brief overview of Project Mercury. What, what is it? David? Oh, sir, I can okay. give the 30-second version. Okay. Elevator speech, go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Timer on. Uh, so this is a citizen science project where we're interested in the microbes that are around us in the built environment and looking at the International Space Station as an interesting built environment. We're having astronauts on the space station collect swabs around the station to see what's living on the space station. We've also, as part of our outreach efforts, collected thousands of cell phone and shoe samples, as, as Nicole mentioned, around the country for comparison to those samples from the space station. And lastly, at all of the places where we collected samples, we grew up microbes, and we're sending a collection of 48 species of bacteria to the space station to see how well they grow in space compared to Earth. That's the short version. <laughs> <laughs> microbes, microbes, microbes. Wow. Awesome. So um, how did this, I'm curious how this kind of project got started. Well, so I guess the way it got started is through an organization called the Science Cheerleaders, which is an organization of current and former professional NFL and NBA cheerleaders all around the country. They do a lot of outreach, great outreach and education already, talking about women in science and science in general. And they wanted to do something with their network of contacts and folks. They wanted to do some real stuff. They wanted to do a citizen science project. They came to us, we expressed interest, and then together we applied for basically a free experiment on the space station through Space okay. Florida and Nanorax, mm -hmm. and we got one of those free experiments, and then the rest of it sort of a from there. Wow. How did you decide on microbes, particularly? Well, we're a microbiology lab, but mm -hmm. the real answer is because microbes are awesome. <laughs> of course, and their names are particularly awesome. Oh. 
perusing them a little bit ago, wondering who's going to pronounce these tonight. <laughs> Go ahead, Nicole. Not yeah. it. No, that's my not it. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They're awesome. really amazing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. That's awesome. So, okay, so there are multiple collection methods. One of them will be collecting microbes on the ISS in particular, right? So it's to see what kinds of microbes are already growing in that environment. Yeah, and that's a very simple collection. We sent, uh, we, well, we're sending in four mm -hmm. days a collection of sterile swabs and instructions on where to sample, and the astronauts will just swab surfaces around the station. We'll get the swabs back, we'll extract DNA, and we'll see all of the microbes that are living on the space station, which we expect to be not hugely different from an office mm -hmm. or a home, but there will be differences, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And what about, uh, so then you also went collecting around the country. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that collection process? Sure. So the goal of the collections was to engage as many people as possible. Since this is a citizen science project, it's a public outreach project, we want people to think about microbes and space and microbes in space. So uh, and because we were working with the science cheerleaders, we targeted a lot of sporting events. Uh, NFL, NBA games, also Major League Baseball. We also targeted museums and some sites of historic interest. So we have a sample from the Liberty Bell going, and we have a sample from uh, the T-Rex at the Chicago Field Museum, and, and some fun things like that. Yeah, here's one of the science cheerleaders at the Orlando Magic Center Court. I know they did center court at a bunch of basketball games. Yeah, um, yeah. They actually recruited a bunch of educators. When I was at the NSTA National Science Teachers Association meeting last year, they recruited a bunch of educators to help at the San Antonio Spurs game. Um, you were right there for that. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, hold on, sorry, I was trying to put my thing back on. Oh, it's fine. Um, yeah, so the San Antonio Spurs, that was our first... Um, sort of rollout of Project Mercury, and um, and it was a very eye-opening <laughs> experience mm -hmm. in terms of um, working with the public and um, sort of creating a, a assembly line of people swabbing their cell phones and their shoes, um, and it was our first opportunity, at the, mine and David's, our first opportunity to see how amazing Darlene's connections are because mm -hmm. we were down on the court and um, we were able to, I don't know, shooting hoops and all sorts of cool stuff. So is there a good crossover that now, so, okay, so George has heard this story. My little brothers are total jock sports fans. They actually both majored in sports management in college. That's how into sports they are. Um, do you think this, and, and I'm like the lone scientist of the family, uh, is this, is this, has this brought a, kind of a new audience to citizen science that otherwise might not have been involved? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that was our first game. The last, the last big sporting event was in Philadelphia, and, and there at a 76ers game. Mm -hmm. And there they were able to actually involve the crowd directly by, um, shooting stuffed microbes along with cell phone and shoes sampling kits out of the t-shirt bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I love so those that, stuffed microbes. Yeah. If that doesn't engage a new audience, then nothing will engage those people. <laughs> You hear that? More t-shirt cannons. That is what science outreach needs. Exactly. <laughs> can't go wrong. Giant microbes. <laughs> We have we have little stuffed squirrels we can uh, shoot out of t-shirt cannons. I think. Yeah, I think. there's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give us ideas. This could go badly. Um, so yeah, Darlene uh, was not able to join us today. She's on a train with very limited internet access. But I wanted to uh, share a picture of her sampling the Liberty Bell. Uh, so this is one of those historic monuments that you guys. Uh, collecting from. I saw Al Roker's weather wall on there as well. Yeah, we sent, we sent swabs to the Today Show, and they swabbed on air, and they did a follow-up piece a week <laughs> or two later about the microbe that we identified from the Today Show that's going into space. Very cool, very cool. Oh. So can you tell us a little bit, so this, this, is, this is launching in four days. Right. So are you starting to get excited, or are you starting to get nervous <laughs> about the whole experiment being on a rocket? That's a funny question, because... Um, 
We were originally scheduled to launch last August, I think. Mm -hmm. And about every month we get delayed about a month. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, but that's changing in that now we are getting right up to the last minute before we hear that um, the launch is being delayed. <laughs> so we, we were all ready to go on March 16th. Yeah. Everyone had hotel rooms and flights booked and um, we're all ready to go to the launch and then I think what, the 14th, the launch got Oh my Push gosh. back to the thirtieth. So we are super excited. Yeah. Um, but we are um, also used to um, having our hopes dashed mm -hmm. <laughs> by I think all the little circumstances. So we're a what little the, Yeah. I'm sorry, what have the delays been due to? Different things or different things. The last one was they had um, some Oil contamination, David, correct, jump in if I get it wrong, but <sighs> from the manufacturer of the insulation in the trunk of the spacecraft had some oil um, in the insulation materials, and they were worried about it damaging some optics for some high-definition experiments that were going on. Interesting. So they had to replace that. I assume it's ready to go, but now we just heard that, I don't, we just heard that there's been, an, another rocket was supposed to launch today, and it's been rolled back into the hangar because of a, a fire in some some system that's supposed to track its progress. Oh wow! So it's possible that we will get pushed back again. Yeah. Well, you definitely want to uh, book your hotel room for a few nights at least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> day of, there's weather. There's yeah, yeah. Trying to catch a launch launch when you have to travel is tricky business. Yeah. yeah, it's a long way from California to Florida, so we want to be sure before we get on a plane. That's right. That's right. You guys are both um, working through UC Davis. Um, oh, I, I have a question from Vito. Uh, the places where the microbes are collected are sometimes really strange, and he quotes, in the candy jar on set of the Today Show. <laughs> How do these locations get picked? Is it, is it just this looks like fun, or is there actually like a method behind it? Well, that's the citizen science part of it, because we didn't collect almost any of those samples. You know, We just sent swabs to the Today Show, and they did whatever they wanted. And right. that's been true at most of these events, so it's sort of up to people's imagination as to what they think would be interesting. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I, I would say a candy jar gets a lot of hands on it. Um, Are you guys pretty much open to any kind of, you know, place to get these? Do you have any parameters where, you know, oh, no, we won't, you know, take those swabs or... No, no, we <laughs> open. I think the only, um, the only constraint is that for the most, like, we wouldn't want to, if you swabbed your ear, we are not really interested in, in mm -hmm. collecting samples that are associated with you. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, no. So could other objects them. around, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're interested in microbes. Um, the f a lot of the funding for the project comes from uh, a Sloan Foundation grant to look at the microbiology of the built environment. Mm -hmm. So we encourage people to swab surfaces mm -hmm. um, that would represent sort of the microbial ecosystem of their environment. Um, but then when we send a swab kit to a place like the Today Show, um, they're just looking to have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're, we're totally on board with <laughs> having fun as well. <laughs> one, of them, one of the most surprising things I learned when I was teaching um, a course on astrobiology and so one thing I had to cover was you know basics of biology on earth and and that's when I learned that there are ten times as many microbes on and in my body as there are <laughs> human cells right it's like some small percentage of my mass but that you know I am teeming with microbes mm -hmm. um, that blows me away first of all uh, so we are not looking at those specifically but what um, what are you looking for in terms of environmental microbes? What's the big picture maybe for those of us who aren't as um, up to date on that? Well I'd say part of it is the fact that very little work has been done on microbes in microgravity that mm -hmm. aren't dangerous. NASA has focused their efforts traditionally on things that they're concerned about for the astronauts' health, 
without really looking at the broader question of the natural ecosystem of microbes. Okay. And more and more, as you point out, you know, microbes, we have 10 times as many on us. They're all around us all the time. And we're starting to learn now about the interactions between the microbes in and on us and our environments. And that's traditionally microbiology has been you find this one thing, usually a disease-causing thing, and you, you study it in isolation. And now we're starting to look at the broader question of how do all these microbes work together. Mm -hmm. For example, we don't know what the natural ecosystem of microbes is on the space station, although NASA has looked for, for scary things in the past. All of the bugs that we're sending are non-disease-causing organisms. They're typically found in people-associated environments. So I think that's what's interesting, is to see how those things behave in space. Okay. Also, if... Um I don't know if you have, I don't know if there's some way to post the link, but yeah. David's created, um, so one, one thing that we didn't really mention is that um, all of these micro, all of these 48 that we've collected from surfaces are going to be competing against each other in our experiments on the space station. <laughs> They're going to be, um, we're doing a growth assay, so we'll be looking at how quickly they grow and how densely they grow on the surface that we've given them to grow on. Um, and so we're calling that, and so each of the ones, each of those 48 come from, I don't know, 10 to 15 surfaces from each event. And each of those 48 is the winner of a growth competition from okay. within its event. Um, and then those 48 winners, David's created trading cards for all of them um, with pictures of them and then interesting facts. So I don't know if there's some way to point people to those. They're yeah, really I'm going to share that link on the event pages. Okay. Right now. Um, but it's, it's cool. at spacemicrobes.org is the main site. Uh, you can get there from there, but I'll post it on the event pages too. And I think if you just sort of thumb through those cards, you get a, a sense of, um, you start to get a, a better appreciation for how much diversity there is out there that's not harmful in any way, mm -hmm. um, and how microbes can do cool things and look cool and from interesting places. I know. I'm making I'm making a face because it's icky things, but <laughs> like that's all it's just like blah, coming out of the picture <laughs> with the stick. That's really cool. That one is from oh gosh, where did they find it? Oh, on the Mars Exploration Rover at JPL. <laughs> that's right. For either spirit or opportunity, we don't know which, before long. <laughs> We're actually working with um with some people at the JPL yeah. who, um, who work on sort of sterilizing spacecraft and figuring out who can survive or escape the sterilization procedure. <laughs> they have a lot of those things in culture and they sent some to us. And they have the coolest business cards ever because the guy we work with, his official title is Planetary Protection Engineer. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Here's another one that was um, found on, it, it was a culture that had been saved since 1975 from the Viking Mars orbiter at JPL. So they yeah. just had this sample that they were hanging on to? They save everything that they find. So they assemble spacecraft in clean rooms. They're supposed to be sterile. They're not because that's almost impossible. And they do lots of testing. And every time they find a microbe, they make a stock of it and, and freeze it down or, or freeze dry it down. And so they have thousands of microbes that they've found in their clean rooms over the last four decades or so. Wow. David, you should talk about how they engaged some classrooms to choose their candidates. Yeah, that's true. So there were a number of microbes from JPL that we could have sent. And what they did is they went into high school classrooms in a number of different areas and had and they, they taught classes about JPL and about NASA and about missions to Mars and a little bit about microbiology, and then they had the classes vote on which microbes to send. So each of the ones that are being sent from JPL were actually voted on by, by high school students, which is pretty awesome. cool. Very cool. Um, so I'm looking at the comments. Uh, we already mentioned the Today Show comments. 
I'm going to put that up real quick. We said uh, that you let people choose uh, where they want to, to, to take their swabs. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Guido is also asking, so this is Sunday's SpaceX launch that is doing uh, the launch for you guys, right? So that's uh, another area of excitement for people who are following SpaceX. Yes. Um, and then Call Carruthers says, should hear a go, no go by Friday. That's the rumor. So that's the <laughs> fingers and toes cross. Should hear go no go by Friday, uh, whether or not you guys are going up on the thirtieth. Um, we have a good question from Nancy Graziano. Um, are you anticipating there will be any differences between similar microbes and strains that experience microgravity versus ones that are in normal Earth gravity? So I know you're splitting all these into two groups for that. Well, it's been shown from previous work by NASA and others that some bacteria do behave differently in microgravity. They, they grow into colonies with weird shapes that no one's ever seen on Earth. No one knows yet what that really means, but there clearly are differences. So I expect that of the 48 species we send, some of them indeed will grow differently in microgravity than on Earth. Um, interpreting those differences in a useful way is sort of a whole different story. Okay. Yeah. And you said, that, uh, Jenna, that they were competing. What are they competing for? So um, we, we have their, well, to be able to win, bragging rights. No, they're, they're, we have them on, um, oh, I had one with me. We have them in these plates that have 96 wells in them. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of each well is basically a mini petri dish, I maybe mean, maybe like a couple of millimeters wide, and um, and we put some of these cells on in each well, and then um, we measure how quickly they grow by um, doing UV absorbance through the cells. So as they grow denser, the absorbance goes up, and then um, so we can measure to what density the cells grow on that surface, mm -hmm. and we can measure how quickly they they start they start taking off and growing because they're frozen when the experiment starts. And we can measure how rapidly they grow. So there, are, those are the three basic. Um, I don't know what you call them, but categories. Categories, categories right? <laughs> yeah. So um, from these 48, they're all competing for these three prizes. So you can exactly. pick, I mean, either it's associated with your favorite team, because you've got some pro sports teams in there, or if you're really a fan of the Liberty Bell, <laughs> or, or I guess a, a Philly native, uh, you can root for your favorite microbe um, to win one of these events. I see uh, on the uh, best, best sprinter, best huddle, and best tip-off. That's right, that's right, sporting terms. And you can see how well, on each of the baseball cards, you can see how well they grew on okay. Earth. So oh, so there's actual stats. If you want to bet based on how well it grew on Earth, you could make a, a more informed decision than random. Oh. So <laughs> do you guys have, have brackets in your we office? Did. <laughs> it's totally the time to do it. We are going to have to do that now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Expect to see micro brackets. That's right. We'll give us money for, for calling the brackets correctly. <laughs> and yeah, the, winner, the winner gets a free giant microbe. There you go. There you go. That's a good yeah, prize. Awesome. Are you keeping in touch with any of the high school students that help to choose some of them? Do you know if they're kind of following this or are you going to go back and talk with them later at all? The JPL is coordinating those outreach efforts themselves. So I'm not exactly sure what they're doing, but I believe that they plan to, to go back to classrooms. And in general, we are collecting email addresses of everyone involved in the project. We want to reach out to everybody when we have data. People can find it on the website. Um, but like the cell phone and shoe data, people are particularly interested in, you know, how did the microbes from the event I was at turn out? You know, all that will be on our website, and we're hoping to, to communicate back with people. Great. Okay, awesome. We actually got a question similar to that. Uh, once you collect all your data and have a chance to analyze, what is your next step? So communicating these results is, is part of that. Um, yeah, anything we else? To, we have to provide the data um, on our website in a format that people can interact with. So um, ideally, you would be able to look at what kind of microbes were found on the cell phones at the event I was at, and what kind of microbes were found on the shoes. Now, how do those compare to maybe you're particularly interested in 
making comparisons across cell phones or across shoes, or you have two different sites that you're really interested in, how much do cell phones at the Giants Stadium look like cell phones at the, you know, the Raiders Stadium? Yeah. So um, we hope that people will be able to interact with the data that way, but um, it's not really hypothesis-driven science that we're doing here. It's really exploratory and, um, and aimed at engagement, really. So, um, so we talked about the, they're going to collect some of the ISS. You've collected um, all over the place that we're bringing down to these 48. And also, the, uh, there's also the cell phone and shoe projects. This is the one I got to participate in at Science Online back a few weeks ago, where they gave us, you know, the little consent form. You know, yes, you can use my swabs in research, uh, and the two little, you know, sterilized swabs. So I, I had to swab my phone, and actually, this shoe right here. <sighs> <laughs> so, uh, while I was in North Carolina, which is interesting because it's, you know, the, you're looking at, so why cell phones and shoes? Why are these the things that you're collecting from all over the place? There, well, there's a historical answer. Okay. So, um, we're, well, we thought a lot about what we would have people swab um, so that they could in engage in this process. And um, we already had a collaborator, Jack Gilbert, is at the University of Chicago. He runs the Earth Microbiome Project. And, um, and they had already done some cell phone and shoe okay. sampling. Um, and they had the appropriate approval to do that sort of thing for people. So we just kind of jumped on that. <laughs> nice. But there, there's a more, there's a, a scientific answer, mm -hmm. which I'm sure I'll let David talk about because he's more excited about the science. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, part of the rationale for the original study that we're then sort of following is that shoes are a good measure of the microbes around you. You walk everywhere and you're collecting microbes. Instead of us having, you know, swap the ground everywhere, your shoes have already done that and we're just taking them off of the shoe. Whereas uh, the microbes on the cell phone kind of represent you. Mm -hmm. So it's much more complicated to sample from people directly for sort of obscure legal reasons, but the stuff on your cell phone is, is fair game, okay. and uh, the difference between sort of what's you and where you go is, is one of the interesting scientific questions. Okay. And much, it, it, oh, sorry, I was going to say, what else do you find out about um, your participants besides, you know, here's the stuff for my cell phone? Do you ask them, um, you know, where they live, how old they are, any stuff like that, or is it just... Nope, we're not collecting <laughs> any information other than no, latitude and longitude of the event. And in fact, all of the individuals from an event will be pooled together for the analysis, and that's to preserve anonymity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm really curious to see what the Science Online results <laughs> look like, because we came from all of... <laughs> <laughs> all over the world to that event. So Yeah, so um, hopefully your fun. shoes are more different from each other than Spurs fans, most of whom came from San Antonio. But right. we'll see. Right. Unless you got a lot of teachers from the conference. <laughs> yeah, no, that you guys didn't ask. I just had to sign something saying, Yes, I blah blah blah, whatever. I didn't read it that closely. <laughs> I wrote it. You didn't sign your life away. Okay. I, I scanned it. I scan, you know, I, I, we've, I've, I've learned to do IRB stuff with Georgia, so I, I figured you're not <laughs> getting away with my soul. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just that could be people wanting to know what was, you know, what was on my particular phone. What's on right. I'm sure, yeah. How, how do you answer that when people no, ask, ask that? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> they want to know. All right. How it goes, yeah. Uh, but you will be making that, 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 that collection of data available, so they'll be able to look up their location. Yeah, they'll yeah, be able to see how the other people at that event were pooled together and how to compare. Right, them. and they'll they can check that. Yeah, and actually they'll be they'll be able to see their um, their, their data. data. They just won't know it's theirs. So from a from an event, we might have a hundred data points, and they'll be able to say one of those data points is my data. <laughs> one of those code numbers was mine. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> That's really fun. Really so fun. I want to ask about this uh, unclassified, don't make me pronounce it, 
<laughs> you guys, ba I mean, basically, there, there's like a whole new species in here that came out of, this is out of the 48 that have won and gone on to the, the next round with the International Space Station, and I thought this was kind of cool. So who found this, and is it something completely unknown? So this, this was found by a group of youth cheerleaders um, in Coronado, which is in San Diego, and they swabbed the stadium where they practiced, and when we, we grew it up along with lots of other organisms, but when we sequenced this barcode that we used to see what it was, it wasn't in any of the databases. And so we, we did some, some digging, and it looks like it's an entirely new genus and species within that, that family there that you don't want to pronounce, which okay. is Spingonodaceae. Spingonodaceae. Uh, okay. Spingonodaceae. That's a family that but that's like saying, you know, it's a plant. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's not very specific, and so we're actually characterizing this microbe right now to describe it as a species, which is cool, and we hope to bring it back to the hospital and the children that's collected and maybe involve them in, in, in naming. We're not sure yet. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Was that a surprise that you would find something you know, unknown? Yes and no. It's yeah. no in the sense that there are millions and millions of microbes okay. all over the planet, only some small subset of which have been described. So in that sense, no. However, the conditions that we grew up in, these are standard conditions that microbiologists have been playing around with for 100 years. I thought it was a little surprising to find something so deeply uncharacterized using standard techniques. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, I, and I also like how it looks like it's been it's followed the swab right on the petri dish as well. Is that why it makes that that well, pattern? That's actually, we did that on purpose to make sure that it's not contaminated with some other species. Okay. We pick a single colony of bacteria and we stream it out across a plate like that to make sure there's nothing else there. Cool. Cool. Uh, we have okay. a question from Andrew Planet. Uh, click that to make it come up. Would microorganisms that produce a gas as a byproduct fill up a low-pressure contained area uh, comparable to low pressure found on Mars? And I'm also thinking a contained area like the ISS. Um, to a could, could you could you use microbes? I think he's talking about terraforming. Like, could you use microbes to increase the pressure of an of an enclosed space? Do you know of any like that? I mean, I don't know off the top of my head, but I mean. That seems like a risky way to increase pressure. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, the, a lot of common, you know, methane is a common gas that's released okay. by, by microbes, and that's not how I'd want to go pressurizing a sure. living environment. So you could pressurize it, you're just not going to get something that is, is happily breathable by m macroorganisms like ourselves. No, I'd say, you know, yeah, plants producing oxygen would probably be a better bet. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, um, so this is uh, project. First of all, okay, don't uh, what what does Mercury stand for? The acronym because I keep screwing it up. <laughs> the spelling does, is it one of those? Does anyone remember? So, yeah. So this acronym was born before David and I joined the project. Okay. So we take no responsibility. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we love the people who came up with this acronym, but we're not super in love with the acronym. Okay. <laughs> So it's um, microbial eco eco ecology research combining citizens on board the ISS. <laughs> I don't know. Sounds good. I don't know. I have to look it up. David, do you know? University. University researchers on the ISS. Okay. okay. That's a bit convoluted. It's torture. Yeah. You know, one amazing acronym. That is, that is, is, uh, it doesn't have any lowercase letters in it, which would make it a truly bad acronym. <laughs> like a true astronomy acronym would have lowercase letters. Um, I think it, I think it was our NASA partner who, okay, who well, there you go. Acronym, yeah. If that helps explain. Yeah, blame me, blame, blame the space does. people. Blame <laughs> the space, no, it's, it's fine. We, we know. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, also regarding uh, the gas question, Jim Beaker pointed out that yeast makes carbon dioxide. Yeast makes CO2. And in fact, we were going to do a little hands-on demo with that, but I think we're going to save that for a future week. I'll wait till we get back to order to do the yeast demo. Yeah, do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're only sending bacteria, too. 
Right, right, right. You're only dealing with bacteria in this particular case with, with Project Mercury. But they um, also produce CO2 <laughs> and oxygen and everything. Yeah. All okay. of it. Um, so the co collaboration is also with SciStarter, and we've talked a little bit about SciStarter here. Um, Jenna, can you, since you write for SciStarter, can you tell us a little bit about SciStarter in general and, and uh, its involvement with Project Mercury? Um, yeah, so I, um, so Darlene Cavalier is the founder of SciStarter um, and Science Cheerleaders. And so it's through her initial connection with Jonathan Eisen, RPI, at Science Online a few years ago, I think, mm -hmm. that the whole collaboration was born. Um, so SciStarter is a database of citizen science projects. Um, it's at SciStarter.com. And, and there you can search for projects, um, you being anyone, mm -hmm. um, science projects that are sort of crowdsourcing all sorts of things, like data collection or um, data analysis in some cases. And you can search for projects based on your interest. So if you wanted to do a project at the beach, or you want to do a project on your computer, or you want to do a project in your classroom, um, you can search based on these features. If you like, want to do, you like birds, you like cockroaches, um, whatever you're interested in, there's probably a citizen science project for that. So um, that's size starter. <laughs> you know, if, if you have it, if, all, all they do, all Cider Cider is doing right now is connecting people to projects. Mm -hmm. um, and for Project Mercury, Cider played the role of um, recruiting participants, largely. And you do a newsletter, it looks like. Yeah. So I yeah. I met Darlene at that San Antonio Spurs game, our first big rollout of Project Mercury, and um, I don't know if anyone is, here has met Darlene before. Mm -hmm. She's um, she's one of these people you immediately like and want to be around. Um, and I thought that I, I was, had never really experienced citizen science as a concept, really, mm -hmm. until this project. And now I think I'm constantly thinking about how to incorporate citizen science in everything that I do. Um, and I wanted to help with SciStarter, so I asked her how I could help. Um, so what I do is I go through the database of projects. I think now we're... We have about 800 projects, wow. and I sort of I try to feature five projects on a theme. So every other week, we have a new theme for um, projects that are featured on the front page and in a newsletter. So right now, um, this past newsletter was our first micro newsletter, um, and we featured Project Mercury because I thought, oh, this is the perfect timing. It's going to launch. Yeah. Um, and now we're featuring projects related to spring. So there are a lot of projects um, that involve some setup. Like if you want to do a hummingbird watch project, well, you need to put your hummingbird feeders out now. So we're trying to sort of alert people to projects as they become timely or are interesting because of the season, that sort of thing. Wow, that's fantastic. And I bet you have a lot of educators. Well, I know you do. You have a lot of educators. It's a lot of things that teachers like to do in their classroom. And I just noticed on the website that you're thinking or somebody's thinking of doing some lessons that might go along with this Project Mercury. Or can either of you say anything about that? Or is that still something in the future? Uh, I think David knows more about that than I do. Yeah, so we've actually been working with uh, an educator who used to do outreach stuff for NASA named Debbie Briggs, and she's actually developed classroom curricula that meet certain state standards uh, for materials that relate to Project Mercury. And that stuff is in the, the final stages of, of being ready to put up on our website so that um, like classrooms could get engaged with the project and the science behind it with pre-made materials. That's great. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. That's that's something we love to do is, is, is come up with the educational materials that teachers can use to fulfill the standards and fulfill the requirements, but bring citizen science from the classroom. So that's really cool. Yeah, that, that's one of the goals. Very cool. Oh, we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, we have another question from Nancy. Um, did you consider collecting samples from pets, paws, or food dishes? Or do you know if anyone is doing research with similar such samples? So you couldn't take it from people for various legal reasons. But we, don't we also couldn't take the samples from their homes. So 
for the same legal reasons. Okay. Any sample that could be linked to a person, we would have to have special approval okay. um, to, to take. I think that includes their pets. But, okay. but there are definitely people looking at microbes associated with pets. I'm not up on the most recent <laughs> research. Well, there's actually some really interesting research about the, the microbiomes of people that live with dogs are very different from the microbiomes of people that live without dogs. And, and so th those kinds of questions are, are being asked. Do we want to know the answers? Do we really want to know the answers? I think of... Uh, oh, well, I mean, if you own a dog, there is dog poo all over your whole house, for sure. And I, 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 we have a cat. I figure, you know, my, my poo microbes everywhere. The paws okay. in the, oh yeah. See, <laughs> see I, I, I have kids. <laughs> I know that, but I don't want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to prove it by science that there's cat poo microbes. Oh, yeah, it's house. priming your immune system. It's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, microbes are good. That's the thing you need to remember for this. Is they're good things, so you want your dog to bring them into your house. Yeah. Yeah, the more dogs, the better. Come on. <laughs> cats. Yeah. <laughs> it's a diversity thing, right? Too. It's you just get all the different kinds together and yeah, yeah. live a better life, right? Because well, you bring microbes from the outdoors, which is a mix of random things, instead of the microbes that choose to live in your house, which may not be the kind of one of the things you want to interact with all the time. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. The hospital is the, the most extreme example of that. Yeah. You get rid of all the natural microbes, and so what's left? All the funky stuff that came from sick people. Yeah, that's a scary thought right there. <laughs> yeah. I'll take the dogs over a hospital. No, give me some dogs. Yes. <laughs> but if you're if you're interested in um, the microbes associated with pets, then um, there is research out there, and I think some of it comes out of Jack. Gilbert's lab. Okay. So, and I think what they're looking at is um, is the the microbes that are found on surfaces of homes um, for people who live with pets versus not. Yeah, don't want to know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but like you said, microbes are good. Microbes are uh, some are good and some are completely not affecting us. Yeah. Where do Most a lot of these microbes on this planet don't care one way or another? Neither do we. It's a neutral relationship. <laughs> what about these microbes in your sample, the 48 that you're testing on the ISS? Do they tend to be pretty much do their own thing, or they? Um, I, I assume they're not disease causing, but that they are just. Uh, they're not disease causing. Uh, that was part of our deal with NASA. They have this thing about that for some reason. Um, <laughs> but uh, do not send Ebola to the space station. <laughs> yeah, well, that's definitely out. That's a matter. Um, so. Most of the microbes that we're sending have been used. They're not beneficial microbes in the sense that, like, they live in your gut and produce vitamins, although those exist. But they're they're things that we use. A lot of them aid in plant growth. A lot of them produce industrially important enzymes. Like, we use microbes for an incredible variety of things, and many of the ones we're sending fall in that category of beneficial. So, in a natural state, they might not be beneficial, but we we learn to use them in a beneficial way. Okay. And so you may learn something about how they grow, um, which would be a benefit if you're farming them for. What would you be farming them for? What would you be using them to make? Well, for example, um, lots of enzymes are used in laundry detergents and things like that are bacterially produced enzymes. Very cool. So think about that next time you're doing your laundry, everyone. Well, speaking of which, I see a nice germophobia question here. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, once you release your findings to the public, do you anticipate an outbreak of germophobia? There you go. That's <laughs> really messy. What do you think? Well, we've already been dealing with this ever since the beginning of the project because and um, anytime people hear the word microbes, they think, ooh, germs, icky, and, and, and we get a lot of that, particularly from the media. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the goals of this project is to communicate two basic concepts of people, which is that microbes are everywhere mm -hmm. and that most of them are good or neutral. That, you know, that's it. And we, we just repeat that over and over again. And the hope is that if you look at these baseball cards, if you look at the microbes we're sending, they're all good, happy things. And so we're hoping really to actually 
counter germophobia. I mean, I don't think it will be, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that there are microbes on the space station. The point that we'll need to make over and over again is that those things that are there are not bad. And I hope that when people see the cell phone and shoe data, that they'll, it'll, they'll get a sense that there are a lot of different kinds of microbes on my cell phone, um, also on her cell phone, on everybody's cell phones. There's a lot of microbes on my cell phone and on everybody's cell phones. Also shoes and the ground. Everywhere you go, there's tons of microbes. So just get over it because they're not going anywhere. But even when we try really, really hard, we can't get rid of them. Um, we don't want them to go anywhere. They're essential for life on Earth. And, um, and they're all over your cell phones and all over your shoes. So it's, it's not a big deal. I hope so, that it becomes a germaphobe <laughs> my work. <laughs> you're, you're trying to do the opposite, yeah. yeah. So, what, so what's your take then uh, on the, the proliferation of antimicrobial everything that's on the market these days? I think it's a really bad idea. Terrible. For the most part. <laughs> I don't know, Dave. I know David has lots of thoughts on the subject. <laughs> I, it's something I blog about regularly, actually. Okay. I mean, one of the things that I, I always like to tell people that makes it so bad. I mean, most people are aware of the concept of antibiotic resistance, right? Mm -hmm. If you throw these antibiotics all around us all the time, we're just breeding resistant strains. But what not everybody realizes is that you can make an antibiotic resistant strain of a beneficial microbe, and then it can give that antibiotic resistance to a disease-causing microbe. That's a really bad thing. So mm -hmm. when we surround ourselves with antimicrobial products, I mean, yeah, most of us don't have anthrax in our house, but we could create an antibiotic resistant strain of a perfectly harmless microbe that could give that resistance to anthrax, which would not be ideal. Mm -hmm. OK, because I have this argument with my mother all the time um, whenever I visit her. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally got her to throw out her antibacterial soaps, um, the ones that were recently given a warning from the FDA. <laughs> but it is good to hear from the people who work with the microbes themselves. Um, I have one, let's see, one more question popped up uh, from Maria Escuela. Does the radiation in space affect your studies? Is radiation at the ISS going to make a difference? I think not over the time frame of this experiment. These bugs are only growing for a few days. If you were doing a long-term experiment and passaging them over multiple generations, I would expect that yes. But over only a few days, uh, it seems that microgravity is more likely to be a contributing factor to differences we see than, than radiation. I and mean, we can't say for sure. That's my feeling. I would assume that there's some shielding from radiation in the ISS, too. Not as much know. as they like. What? Not as much as they like. Not as much as they would like, yeah. Over the course of our study, radiation should not have an effect. So mm -hmm. how long is the experiment running? Is it about two weeks? It, it's four it, days. Four days, okay. We're doing ah, three, three experiments, four days apiece. Okay. They're just replicate, exper replicate experiments. Okay. Um, we have a comment on the blog. Oh, sorry, Dave, I just mentioned you blogged. And you do um, any other social outreach like that and places we can watch maybe for the, the news of all this when you do finally start getting results? And well, everything related to this project will be on the spacemicrobes.org website. Um, we also, all of us, do a lot of tweeting under the um, space microbes hashtag. Okay. okay. That's the hashtag to follow. Okay, because when you guys were tweeting about the Hangout, I was like, follow, 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 but follow hashtag... Or yep. check out the hashtag space microbes, and that'll keep you up. Hashtag space, space microbes. Awesome. 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 Space microbes. I love this project. <laughs> um, Jim, I, I just had to point out that Jim Beaker comments that he has parrot poop germs all over his, his place. <laughs> <laughs> so. Definitely. It's not just the, the dogs and the cats. Oh, I know. The more germs, the better. The more germs, the better. I like that. Um, going through some more comments, uh, so Nancy uh, chimed in that she refuses to buy antimicrobial anything. Uh, the best defense is to develop a good immune system by getting sick. This works for a lot of things. Not everything, but <laughs> works for some Yeah, not, not everything. That, that's not the recommended strategy for Ebola. Right. What do you think that makes you stronger, right? 
<laughs> Unless it's Ebola and it just kills you. So it's in the <laughs> news right <laughs> now. Yeah, that, that's the problem. I read Hot Zone when I was a teenager, so that really had an impact on me. <laughs> Um, and uh, Andrew Planet also uh, mentions he was, uh, when we talked about the gas before, was asking particular in terms of photosynthesis. Are any of these photosynthesizing bacteria that you're sending to the ISS, do you know? Uh, I don't think that's so. a good question. I doubt it, but okay. I wouldn't totally rule it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm looking at the the picture, so looking at the the uh, the, the microbe trading cards, and some, I see David, you were the photographer for at least one or, or a few of these. Uh, is there anything special that goes into taking these photos of the the um, the colonies? Well, actually, most of those were taken by undergraduates in our lab. Okay. Um, and there's nothing special that goes into taking them. I mean, we just have a macro lens on a regular camera, and we take pictures of the plates. Any of the really cool pictures are like electron micrographs that I took off the internet. Okay. Yeah, I see from Wikipedia, from Wikipedia Commons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Places that are, that are freely available. It, it takes a lot of work, actually, to get like a really nice electron micrograph of a, of a bacteria. Can you briefly mention what electron, mic electron micrograph does to, to take a picture? Um, so, like in a scanning electron micrograph, you, you coat the sample with gold, and then you, you shoot a beam of, I don't know what kind of particles, at it. And as they bounce off the gold, they, they, you can look at the reflection and, and make a virtual image. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's electrons. Yes, electrons. There you go. <laughs> uh, there was one more, and it's just, oh, gosh, they're jumping around. Oh, uh, Carl Carruthers is asking, do you know uh, where the astronauts will be swabbing in the ISS, or do they have um, free reign to swab wherever they want, like the citizen That's science? That's Jenna's question. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we, this is, a, this is an interesting question, because um, interacting with astronauts is really, really difficult work. <laughs> Um, for a number of reasons, their time is really precious, mm -hmm. and, um, and what we've been told is that they're they kind of slow down a little bit mentally, and so we had to give them very explicit instructions um, to swab a limited number of places, uh, and um, and we tried as best we could to think of surfaces that would be analogous to surfaces in a home. Also, surfaces that were analogous to cell phones and shoes. Okay. Yeah, there's not as much walking. <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, we had them swab their little handheld communication devices that are on the wall. So first of all, um, I got to go to Houston and walk through the, the ISS mock-up. Um, and so while I was in there, I was thinking, what surfaces would be good yeah. to have them swab? So. They're swabbing their little handheld communication devices. And then also when they go to operate the robotic arms, mm. they strap their feet into these things that look like a, almost like a, um, a elliptical trainer kind of yeah, thing yeah. Um, so that they can operate the joystick. So we had them swab those. And then the study that I mentioned before where they were looking at the homes of people who have pets versus not have pets, in those studies they, they swabbed the pillows and um, a few other door sills. And so um, we had them swab you know, like where they sleep um, and also uh, air vents because mm. on Earth door sills give you a a good feel for kind of what's just generally hanging out in the air because mm -hmm. dust settles on them. People don't usually dust them regularly. Mm -hmm. um, but on the when there's no gravity, dust doesn't settle the same way. So we have we're having them swab the air vents, air intake vents. Um, so that, that that was our thinking and trying to. We had a limited number of samples to work with. They're swabbing 15 surfaces, and we gave them one crew choice. So there's one surface that where they can swab whatever they want. Okay. Well, that'll be fun to see what they come up with. Yeah. <laughs> um, Nancy Graziano asks, is collecting samples from astronauts subject to the same restrictions as for, for other citizens using the project? It's even worse, it's even worse. which is why we're not doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I think that we we talked to I can't remember the title of this person, but the person who's sort of in charge of crew time, mm -hmm. um, who like their handler, I guess. <laughs> um, she seemed willing to let us sample whatever we want. At one point, we were like, "Will they swab the toilet?" And she was like, "Sure, no problem." <laughs> But we decided to take requests like that out so that we didn't raise any red flags. Mm -hmm. We didn't want people... But the astronauts themselves would be a whole different different mess of paperwork. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it's, yeah, yeah. it's human subjects research. It doesn't matter where they are. It's still... It's, uh, yeah, it's the same, only... Um, only you have NASA administration. Yeah, exactly. You have IRB... Plus NASA. That's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> yeah, paperwork. <laughs> and it's high profile too. So inevitably, on on these surfaces, um, we're going to find things that might have sort of scary names. So we don't. If we find something that's called Bacillus anthracis, <laughs> which is what causes anthrax, um, we don't. We don't, I don't know, we don't want to be announcing that sure. on this particular astronaut has anthrax, <laughs> even though it could be something that's just very closely related to anthrax and it's not harmful at all, which is a lot of species are closely related to anthrax, but not harmful at all. Right. So yeah, you have a limited population on the ISS, whereas you had, you know, 200 of us at a conference. Right. It's easier to get lost in the data. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, so, uh, so we're coming up on the hour. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with a few announcements, and um, maybe you guys can give your last uh, pitch at the end, um, telling people to watch the launch or whatever else you want to end with. Um, hang on, I'm getting an echo from David. Can you lower your sound a bit? Uh, hearing my own echo, voice echo back. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, today's Wednesday, which means the next Hangout is going to be Friday, which is the Weekly Space Hangout hosted by Fraser Kane. We'll be wrapping up your space news from the week. Um, and that is at noon Pacific on Google+. On Sunday night is the Virtual Star Party. It's usually after Cosmos has aired across the U.S. Um, so I don't know exactly what time it is going to be again this week, but check the Virtual Star Party Google Plus page, and we'll put it out in the CosmoQuest newsletter that goes out in the morning. Um, the Monday is Astronomy Cast at noon Pacific, where Fraser and Pamela, uh, schedules permitting, will be uh, recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast and then answering your questions, followed by a new hangout we have in the rotation on Tuesday. Um, I ha don't know if the event has gone up for it yet, but uh, Pamela is hosting the Google Lunar X Prize Hangouts on Tuesday mornings U.S. time. Uh, so look for that event as well. And then we'll back around to Wednesday's Learning Space, and Georgia will be off at a conference, but I will be here, and I'm going to have a, a dis another discussion stemming out of Science Online. We're talking with Emily Fink and Niz Liz Neely um, about the um, science education and uh, so what models do and don't work in terms of science education. Can, is just telling people the facts enough? Uh, so we'll be discussing that next week um, on Learning Space. So same, well, I'm not sure if we've nailed down the time yet. We may be changing the time to earlier if we can, which I know makes Europeans happy. So yay! <laughs> and Georgia happy, so because we're not here. Yeah, I'm waiting for that too. Yeah, that too. <laughs> so we're not here. You're not here as late. Um, so that's the roundup of Hangouts coming up. Um, maybe David and Jenna can uh, give your last parting words bef of, um, of your favorite thing about this project, and then maybe plug the launch on Sunday. Um, I think David can't. Yeah. Okay. David can't hear you oh, no. anymore. So. Um, yeah. I'll do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll just wrap it up. Um, so, I mean, for sure, the best thing about this project is um, this engagement opportunity. It's been it's been really cool to have co this kind of conversation about microbes, um, whether or not they're all harmful. No, um, and I don't know, just the sort of opening people's eyes to the idea that they're around us and they're not hurting us, and in many cases they're helping us. So 
let's all embrace our microbes. Um, I think the opportunity to say that to a wide audience has been the, the best thing about this project for me. Um, interacting with NASA is really, really cool. It's not anything I ever thought I'd be doing as a microbiologist. Yeah. And, um, and that's been a really interesting experience, often very frustrating, but, um, but mostly pretty awesome. Um, and you know we get to go to see a rocket launch whenever that has to, that happens. Um, so I th there's a lot of <laughs> really cool stuff about this project, and um, and I can't wait to get data and start sharing data with people. That's going to be fun as well. Um, and then I would just encourage everybody who's interested in projects like this. Um, to go to SciStarter.com um, and see if you can find something near you or that you're interested in to get involved in, because I think uh, citizen science is a lot of fun, both for both for the researchers who get to blab on about their favorite thing in the world, um, and for people who get to feel like they're a part of the discovery. Very cool. Thank you. So yeah, go to SciStarter.com uh, when you're not marking craters craters with CosmoQuest, which is fun <laughs> and, and we love doing. Uh, there are lots of projects that will let you go outside and do science outdoors and with spring or autumn coming, depending on your hemisphere, it's a good thing to get outside every once in a while. So go find a citizen science project that takes you outside as well. Um, and then check out spacemicrobes.org to follow this project. I'll be That's watching for the launch, so yeah. yeah. All right, thank you so much, you guys. Sorry your sound went out, David. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for uh, watching, for your comments and questions, and we will see you next time on Lorraine Space. Okay. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.